thank you so much for coming down here and doing the show and sharing some of your insight and some of your work with us. It's very fascinating and terrifying at the same time. Your book uh, has a very dystopian vibe to it. I'm not going to lie. The Countdown, How Our Modern World is Threatening Sperm Counts, Altering Male and Female Reproductive... Repro- Repro- wow, easy for you to say. <laughs> Reproductive development and imperiling the future of the human race. How did you first discover that this was a problem and that uh, some of these chemicals and plastics were actually threatening the future of our species? Before I go into that, I just want to thank you, Danny, for inviting me and for being a wonderful host. And I'm so happy to be here and talking to you and people who are listening yeah, my about this uh, important problem. So how did I get into this? Uh, I have to say that, you know, way back in the middle 90s, um, I knew nothing about endocrine disruption or phthalates or any of this. I was completely ignorant. And um, I got asked to sit on a committee, a federal you know, committee called the National Academy of Sciences, kind of a big deal. And they invited me because of my neutrality, I think. You, so usually in those committees, there's people who take one position and the opposite position and the people in the middle who are neutral. And I was a neutral. Although they didn't say that explicitly. That was clear when I got there. Um, And so I was completely open. I had never heard of endocrine disruptors um, or their effects or their purported effects. And so the, the goal of this committee was to determine whether these chemicals, which can impact the body's hormones, known as endocrine disrupting chemicals, whether those are actually something that we need to pay attention to, right? Mm. So I love challenges, I love puzzles, and I thought, wow, this will be fun, and I'll meet new people, and yeah, I'll do this. And um, one of the first things we did was to look at this paper that had come out a few years earlier out of Denmark. And this paper was alarming because it said that sperm count had dropped 50% in the prior 50 years. Okay? It came out in 92. Mm. All right. And so the committee asked me as a statistician, which is what my doctorate is in, uh, to look at this and tell the committee whether this is something they could, you know, consider for their work on the you know in this committee and although it wasn't related directly to at that point to hormonally active agents in the environment which is what the committee was called right so we had this harm that appeared to be going on with unknown costs at that point so i looked at the paper and i have to say i was not uh impressed why weren't you impressed um well, first of all, it was very thin in terms of number of words and pictures and data. And the data that were there, if I had a graph, I could show it to you. But, I, but you've seen it, in, I think, in yes. maybe. Yeah. And um, th- a lot of the data were in recent years. They were kind of spotty over the time period. And more importantly, perhaps, there were not, you know, any of the factors that we worry about, which might cause an erroneous decline, none of those were considered. So I said I wasn't sure. And so the committee said, well, can you investigate this and let us know what you think? Okay. So I had the good fortune to be on sabbatical and be able to do that. And I spent six months answering that question. So let me just give you an example. So you might yourself think about things that could make it, but you read about it, so that doesn't, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, you know, somebody approaching this might think, well, okay, that went down because, you know, in more recent years, the men were older. That could make it down somewhat. Actually, sperm count doesn't decline dramatically with age, so that might be a small factor. Um, Maybe the men are more stressed that's probably happening, mm. and stress actually does 
lower sperm count. Okay. And the men could have been more obese. And obesity lowers sperm count. And maybe most importantly, you might ask, well, maybe the way we count sperm has changed. So that in recent years, the counting method counts lower. You know, methods change. And maybe they're not exactly the same over the 50 years, right? So, and finally, there was the question of who are these men? And maybe if you think about, you can't ask a man on the street to give a sperm sample, right? So right. a man has to volunteer and he has to usually have a motivation to do that. And maybe he's doing that because he's going to get a vasectomy. Then he has very good sperm count, right? Because he's had a lot of children. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he's doing that because he's having trouble conceiving. And then he has low sperm count. So mm -hmm. the selection of the population is really important. Right. Right? So there were 61 studies. And so I took out of those 61 studies, I got them, retrieved them, looked through them, and took out of them any information I had on these and other relevant factors. I also took out what country they were conducted in and, and so on and so forth. So all the details I could about the study. And then I and my colleagues put them in a you know, spreadsheet <laughs> and ran a more complicated analysis than had been done before. Mm. So we called it multivariable because we had all these variables in there, right? We're not just looking at the decline. And Danny, it was staggering to see that after all that work of six months and <laughs> accounting for all these factors, the slope changed from minus 0.93 to minus 0.95. It didn't change at all. Right. That's million sperm per milliliter okay. per year. And wow, I just like, I went back to the committee and I said, I can't make this go away. It looks like it's real. And then I did another analysis, which we don't have to go into detail unless you want to, where I, I re-abstracted the studies from the literature thinking maybe the original ones were biased, you know? And then I ended up with 101 instead of 61. So that was good. More studies, longer time period. And then the slope was minus 0 0.94. So you see nothing made any difference. Right. Right. It's so, I mean, it's so unusual in science to see that, that consistency, you know. So I thought, okay, this is something I really have to look at. And that began sort of the mystery story <laughs> you mm -hmm. know that i tell in countdown and i tell to people and we can tell it to, i can tell it to you today uh, of how i began unraveling that and trying to find out what was going on so what year was it when you started your study your study where you took uh how many patients or how many people was it or how many young men that you studied in 2017 ah uh, so 2017 was actually not a study it was a, a, a meta study so we didn't actually study anybody 2017 is the sperm decline paper oh right right so do you mean that one i think so i think you you mentioned that you uh in the, there was a study that involved something like 250 children or or young men where you conducted it and it's still ongoing ah uh, that's much later okay yeah so that's that was the one that's ongoing now is tides and that's um, started in 2011. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's that's a different kind of a different story. Mm. Um, but now we're talking about sperm count. So in terms of sperm count, what I asked after I saw this, not making you know couldn't make it go away. So I thought, well, what could be causing it? It's a natural question. You see something, you don't know what causes it. So. I decided that an interesting thing would be to think about what the environment is doing. Because we couldn't explain it by those other lifestyle factors, right? Stress, age, obesity. But maybe something in the environment is making this happen. And maybe that's changed over time. When you say you couldn't explain it by the lifestyle factors, what made you... I mean, it seems like you probably could explain it by the lifestyle factors, right? 
No, because when we included them, it didn't change the slope at all. Oh, right. Okay. See? So mm. that th- those factors did not make this go away. I see. Adjusting for those. It's called controlling for confounders. Okay. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, when you can control for something uh, like a confounder, you'll put that in the model and then the slope will change or the result will change. I understand. But when we put those in, nothing changed. So they weren't accounting for anything, actually. Um in those 61 studies. So so we thought, okay, well, maybe it's environment. So how do you address environment? So this is really not obvious what to do, but what we did was, what I did, I, I, I selected four cities in the United States with different environments. And I recruited the men in exactly the same way, so there wasn't that problem with selection bias. And... I can, I'll tell you in a minute how we did that. And then we measured the sperm exactly the same way in each of the four centers, okay? And to, to make sure we were doing that, all of the technicians from the four centers came to UC Davis and were trained together, and they used the same counting devices, the same counting chambers in all places. And then every month they had a quality control send out. So what they did was they took one semen sample, split it in four, tested it in Davis, sent it to the four centers, and the four centers sent back their findings. How many sperm, how much did they move, what were their shapes, the way okay. you evaluate sperm. So that in that way, we knew that throughout the study, everybody was doing things the same way because we were trying to do replicates of the same study in four places, right? Right. Which, diff- which cities did you choose? Okay. So at that time, I was living in Columbia, Missouri, which is in the semi-rural center of Missouri, very much exactly in the center of Missouri. Okay. okay. And, um, and they grow a lot of crops there. So that was the agricultural center. Okay. And then we included Minneapolis, which is obviously urban. Mm-hmm. We included New York, and we included Los Angeles. So... Maybe not the best pick, but that's w- what we picked, and we wanted them to be distant, and we wanted them to, and we wanted to be able to work with the people <laughs> that we had to find collaborators, right? right? So, by the way, the in Europe, a similar study went on independently with four cities, and they had a similar finding to what I'm going to tell you. So, um, so what we did. The first thing we I asked was, how who should we include? Because that's always a question. Who's your population? In fact, whenever you see a result of a study, you should ask, what's the population and how did they get in the study? Because there's so many ways that you know biases can creep in there. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So we wanted to get an unbiased population, but we also wanted to know what's called what is the parent population. So we're going to get a sample, and where is it coming from? You can't get semen from a man on the street. You can't get a random semen sample. Right. You just can't do it. Okay. So I decided that the group that absolutely always goes for medical care is pregnant women. Almost always. Mm -hmm. Right? So I decided to recruit pregnant women in order to recruit their husbands. Okay. Kind of devious, maybe, but... <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. And, and so we did a couple study. The goal, first goal was on the, you know, about the semen quality, but there turned out to be extremely valuable that we had done that. So in these four s- places, we identified um, prenatal clinics that would work with us, and we became partners, and that was called the Study for Future Families. Okay. okay. So we enrolled the woman. At that point, we took her when we could get her. So we didn't control the time of pregnancy, which mm. was a later uh, effort. And we asked her, would you be in the study? And would you ask your partner, husband, to be in the study? And some did not want to ask their partner to give a semen sample. Hmm. Interesting. But... Um, most did, and most did agree, but we weren't asking them for a lot. We were asking them, the women, for a urine sample, 
um, and a questionnaire and a blood sample. But they give that anyway when they're pregnant. Mm-hmm. You know, so it wasn't really uh, an, an imposition. And then from the husbands, we wanted, in addition, a semen sample. Right. So we got over 900 men and women to do this. Wow. Yeah. Approximately equally distributed amongst our centers. And then we looked at their semen quality. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And what we found was absolutely alarming and unexpected. And what we found was that the men living in central Missouri, in Columbia, had half half as many moving sperm as men in Minneapolis. Wow. That's what I said. Wow. And is that, that's obviously due to... Wait, wait. Okay, sorry. (laughs) We don't know. Don't don't jump there. But your question, I know where you're going. Mm-hmm. You're going to say... The ag- agri- agriculture right. and pesticides. So that's the obvious difference between those mm-hmm. places. But you can't conclude that that's the reason unless you actually show it. Right, right. right. And unfortunately, we didn't have enough money to do that on the whole population. So how, how, would, you do, how would you do that? How would you find out if pesticides were important? If they were important to the study? Yeah, to make if pesticides could account for the difference, I shouldn't. You're not my student. I shouldn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess just test them against people who are nowhere near that stuff, right? How would you know that? Geographically? Well, they're they're fixed. We they're we've got them. They've got their addresses. They're fixed. We're not getting new people. We're just going to stay with these people, and we want to know in these two groups of men. Let's say say. 250 in Missouri, 250 in Minnesota, mm-hmm. that have very different semen quality, could exposure to pesticides be the question? You know, the, it could explain this. Mm-hmm. So it turns out, very luckily for us, that you can measure pesticide exposure in the urine. And I remember I told you that we got the men's urine. Yes. So, and we got that at the same time they gave a semen sample. Okay. All right? Right. So we could ask, okay, are the levels of pesticides in the men's urine at that time when they gave the semen sample related to their sperm quality at that time? And the answer was yes. And we found five pesticides that were very different between men who had very good semen quality and very poor semen quality in uh, Missouri, in our, our center in Missouri. Five different pesticides. Yeah. Wow. Well, several were um, triazine alternatives like atrazine. You have you heard? Of, I don't yes. know if you heard of atrazine. Yeah. yeah. So those were big players. Enjoy that liquid death. No plastic. Mm. Death to plastic. Death to plastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, were any of the people that you, in the study, could you tell what their occupation was and what they did for a living? Absolutely. Okay. Were any of them workers on farms? dealing Not, like, not, not. Abundantly, you know, not they didn't explain it. Right. Um, there were some, but pesticides exposure is occupational, but it's also through the air and water and through the food, which of course is, you know, distributed mm. across the country right. or even the world. So everybody gets exposed to pesticides, and yes, the sprayers and the applicators of pesticides are more exposed, but we had very few of those. Okay. We also asked them how many miles they live from a farm, you mm-hmm. know, to look at that. So just let me say the European study also found significant differences between their four cities, particularly between Finland and Denmark, where Finland was high and Denmark was low. Um, but they didn't do this um, kind of investigation into specific chemicals that we had right. done. Right. Okay, so we published that, and that was the first study that really showed that pesticides um, can directly affect sperm count. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe not the first, but it was an important study. Uh, Yeah, but um, that's only you know part of the story, right? Um, And we asked later. (laughs) Let's see how much later. Um, I guess around 2014, we asked, okay, what's happening now with a sperm count? Because we'd seen it going down in the Carlson study, 
And then in the studies that I conducted, and it didn't go away, and it was still the same de- rate of decline. But then there was a, this was a long gap, you know. To and so we thought, okay, what's going on now? And we were at a meeting, some colleagues and I, and we were saying, should we do this? Should we try to figure this out? And yes, we decided we like to do that. That would be good. And it's funny how these things get born, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just, and um, I think I presented there, and then they wanted to. Like, what's next? You know, what's happening (laughs) now? Um, So we put together a wonderful group of researchers to do an update of that paper and of the 2000 paper. And um, by then, a couple of things had happened. One of them was that the methods for evaluating the literature, which Carlson had done back in 92 with kind of not very well developed methods because they weren't there. Uh, those had been improved and the method which is called meta-analysis. Have you heard that term? Yes. Yeah, yep. good. So meta-analysis was then had become a term of art. Everyone was wanting to do it and it really seemed to be the most objective and rigorous way to do an analysis of this kind. Um, it's often used, for example, to compare to treatments, you know, treatment A, treatment B, how do they compare? There's been 20 studies of this. How do you put them together? Okay. Right? Got it. But this was different. This wasn't comparing treatments. This was saying, here are these data all over there. What do they report as, as a body of literature in terms of sperm decline? So you can see it's, it's quite different, very challenging to figure out what's the context of this. And we, what we decided was search the literature for every study that had certain keywords in it. Okay. Keywords like sperm count, sperm concentration. And we they didn't have to say trend or they didn't have to say decline or anything like that. They just had to report a sperm count. Okay. Okay. And the other thing they had to do was not um, include men that were biased in different ways. And we had other exclusion criteria. They had to be in English because mm-hmm. we didn't have enough people speaking different languages. Yeah. Um, they had to com- have all the data, right. not just an abstract, and so on and so forth. And and so we ended up with a large number of studies, which we, I mean, thousands of studies. In fact, we went to a meta-analysis expert, and we told him what we wanted to do, 7,500 studies, and he said, no, no, you can't do that. And a guy, Levine, the first author of what finally came out, who was the head of epidemiology for the armed forces of israel oh <laughs> he, really? he he knew how to get things done and he said oh no we'll just get more people so we enrolled a, a, a group of seven people who would work with us on this for no money by the way and we spent over a year going through these 7500 articles so you can imagine this is fairly tedious you want to do it consistently you want to do replicates so to you know it's to one person looking over another one's shoulder, you want to make sure you know, you're know, you not missing anything, mm-hmm. and then you want to capture the data. And what we captured the data on was 185 studies. So it came down to 185 studies that were eligible. Okay. They had the numbers, they were unbiased, as far as we could tell, mm-hmm. and there we could use the data. And the head of the armed forces in Israel helped you. No, with that. epidemiology. Oh, I'm sorry, of, head not of epi- epidemiology. Okay, <laughs> epidemiology for the armed forces. For, okay, the See, head of epidemiology for the armed forces. Yeah. Huh. That's an interesting combination. Well, he was an epidemiologist, and he was in the armed forces, and right. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that's really not really important, except to say that a guy knew how to get things done. That, that, yeah. that was what that said to me. That's, you know? that's said, safe to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, yeah, one, one of the things that in your book that really caught me by surprise was when you, you mentioned that some of the sperm banks, specifically in California, the processes and some of the criteria that in which they evaluate people to be eligible to donate sperm are insane. Like it's you, I think it's easier to get accepted to Harvard than it is to donate sperm at one of these banks in California. (laughs) Yeah. You have to like be a certain age to be educated to a certain level. What what were some of the other criteria? There were some crazy things. Health criteria. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't actually remember that. We went to that sperm bank, a sperm bank in California and talked to them. And that's where we got that information. But that 
sperm banks are not um, going to be in this study. Mm -hmm. You see, because to give to a sperm bank, you have to have a certain quality of sperm. <clears throat> so, and that's due to what the women request mostly, right? That they want. Their no, women. a sperm bank will not accept sperm that's below standard WHO standards for semen quality. Mm-hmm. It's not about what the the women might want something having to do with the man's interest height. or education or height or whatever. They had to be above like what five eight or something, something like that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but um, th- what we cared about was their sperm Mm -hmm. and 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 because they're selected to be in a sperm bank they're actually sperm donors they're going to be way above average right right and so we didn't include them in this study that we're talking about the meta-analysis right yeah so um that study started at that meeting in 2014 and it was finally published in 2017 right Mm -hmm. and you know, just blew me away that it had the same results, basically, as Carlson. <laughs> still 50% in 50 years, still 1% per year. But that, we did two things that were very different from what Carlson had done. One is we'd separated countries by geography. So, okay. and why? What would, countries? Yeah. So, what I had seen in my 2000 publication was that there were very few studies from what we ended up calling other and then a lot most from western i'm putting air quotes because it's you know you have to define what that is mm-hmm. so western was europe north america australia and new zealand okay and those are the places where there were a lot of data and these are countries that are westernized whatever that means which can be quite political by the way (laughs) the other countries south america asia um africa had very few data and because here's the kicker because the non-western studies were late in the time period there were more if you think of a line there were all up to the right of the line that's where they came in there weren't any early studies very few from non-western countries okay that means that there's a bias that the end of you know the early years had mostly contributions from western studies Mm -hmm. whereas the late years had a number of you know for fair amount of contributions from other countries Mm -hmm. and so that's called confounding you can't separate the effect of geography from time because they're mixed up Right. 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 And so in order to do that, we d- did what's called stratified. So we divided the studies into Western and other. Okay. And then we could look at the slope specifically in Western and specifically in other. Okay. Right. I'm going to make you into an epidemiologist. I love it. <laughs> um, okay. So then the other th- way we stratified was what kind of men were these? What kind of men? Yeah. What? Interesting. Yeah. How do you categorize them? And the way we categorized them was in two groups. Those men who were known to be fertile, okay? That means they had had a child mm. or they were married to a pregnant woman. Mm. And the other ones were, let's call them, unselected. Okay. They had not been. So the, the fertile men were selected in some way. They had proven their fertility. Okay. There's a question about whether they should have been in there at all, because generally we tried not to select on anything that was related to sperm count. But we kept them in there because there were some very good and, you know, my study, the Europeans four city study, you know, and it, it seemed like we wanted to see what's going on with that those men, too. So we kept them separate, fertile men, and the other men men who did not know their sperm count, did not know their fertility, were the most representative. So, you see, they, they're they ignorant. Yeah. So they can't select in or select out. Okay, that makes sense. On that basis. Right. So, four groups, four slopes. Wow. And the strongest slope was this unselected Western men. And that's where about half of the men were. And that's the line that's very much the same as Carlson. Okay. Yeah. And how? what is the earliest that they started uh, measuring the sperm count in Western countries? In our study? 
Yes. 73. 73. Yeah. Okay. And it's gone, or, or is it sperm count specifically that has gone down? I think you say by 1% per year and yeah. is now recently up to 2.5%. We'll get to that, but okay. <laughs> yeah, one yeah. percent per year mean in that study mm -hmm. sperm count. At what point? Sorry if I'm jumping ahead. I don't know if I am or yeah. not, but you can uh, correct me if I am. But at what point in the study did you guys uh, s decide to start measuring the taints of humans? Sorry to interrupt, but this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Verso. We all know how important it is to get the right amount of nutrition, exercise, and sleep as we age. It's something I'm really passionate about and have discussed at length with doctors and nutritional scientists on this podcast. That is why I use Verso. Verso is a company dedicated into translating scientific breakthroughs into products that hold the potential to increase longevity. I take cell being every day to help combat aging by increasing my NAD levels with powerful ingredients such as NMN, transresveratrol, and TMG. NAD plus is arguably one of the most powerful molecules in the body, but declines with age. Keeping NAD plus levels high helps guide longevity genes called sirtuins. Sirtuins are called longevity genes because by activating them, they support overall health and slow down aging related effects by regulating important processes inside of cells. High NAD plus levels can improve your metabolism, repair damaged DNA, and ramp up energy production in your brain, immune system, and muscles. Now you can't take NAD plus as a supplement because it's too big for the cells to absorb. But NMN directly converts to NAD plus, while resveratrol activates your sirtuins, which increases their attraction for NAD. These two molecules act synergistically and increase your NAD plus more than just NMN on its own. Verso also publishes third-party testing from each batch produced to absolutely guarantee you're getting what you pay for. Head on over to ver.so and use the coupon code CONCRETE at checkout to save 15% off your entire order. Or go to ver.so forward slash K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E right now. It's linked below. Now back to the show. Okay. That was not in this study. Not in the study. Not. Okay. No, that's a, sort of a... Separate story. Okay. Let's get to that afterwards. Okay, so let's finish the sperm count. So, uh, although it's not a finished story, but it's... so so we published that in 2017, and it was it was a huge paper. I have to. It was just a huge paper. It was the front front page cover of story of Newsweek. Oh wow! It, it was it was all over the world. It was global. It was viral, and it led to countdown. So after this was published, um, an agent came to me and said, would you like to write a, a book about this? And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I'd never written a book and I write papers for scientific audiences, right? Right. But then I began to think, I know a lot no more than, you know, after this came out than I did when we started these studies. And I thought, well, there's a message here that people should be hearing, and they're not going to learn about this at scientific meetings. Right. So I think I have to talk to somebody else like you mm -hmm. <laughs> and your audience uh, to, to let them know what's going on. And so I decided to write the book. And I got a wonderful co-author, and that went on. So now let me go back to the sperm decline, because I haven't finished that yet. So we did publish that sperm count had declined 1% per year in unselected men in Western countries, and also in fertile men in Western countries. Uh, in the other countries, which is um, Asia, Africa, other continents, mm -hmm. Asia, Africa, um, uh, what am I missing? Asia, Africa. South America. Uh, South America. Thank you. <laughs> um, we just didn't have enough studies to say anything. You didn't have enough studies, but I'm curious. What did you see as far as sperm counts in those countries? I'm specifically South America. I'm curious about. I can't tell you that there weren't enough studies to say. You see, when you what what you see, if it's few studies with large variant, var a lot of variability, you might see a line going up or going down. But what we say is not significant because the possible alternative lines are very very wide. Okay. I gotcha. Wide what we call confidence intervals. Okay. And you can't draw any conclusions. Okay. So you have to be careful when you read a paper if it says, you know, this you know happened, you know, this went up or this went down. Look a little deeper and say how sure are they of this? Mm. Right? Okay. And and when you ask that about the non-western countries say how sure are you about this? We had to say not sure or not. Not sure enough to make any conclusions. Wow. So, um, 
a few years later, we decided, this gets boring, I'm sorry, <laughs> but that we should do it again. Okay. And the reason we should do it again is we... Th- we knew from tracking the literature that more studies had come out in these non-Western countries, and maybe now there was enough. And from looking at the literature, it looked like things had gotten worse. So we started all over again and got in a seven-year period from the time our last, you know, selection stopped Mm -hmm. we got all we repeated the whole thing we got all the literature and we abstracted the data and we put it in a database and roughly what year was this that you restarted that you did it again we restarted it in uh 18 2018 yeah and um and we published it in 2022 so last year yeah so maybe it was 17 that we started because we went Seven years, so maybe it was 2015. I don't know. Anyway, we covered seven years. Yeah, I can't remember when we started it. Um, and um, two things. One is, yes, there were enough studies in non-Western countries now to say that in unselected men, there was a significant decline. Okay? Okay. So that answered that. <laughs> uh, and we have to go on. Of course, we have to read do this again and again every right. X years. Yes. Um, and But maybe more alarming, and this is what you alluded to, and I said, wait, uh, that the 1% decline that we had seen in the past was now, if you look at studies in recent years, that was from 2000 to, I think it was um, 2015, I don't remember, I think that's right, uh, the rate was 2.6% per year. Whew. Right? So, wow. Not only have people not listened to this, they haven't done anything to make it. So it's more than doubled. It's more than doubled. So that's the path from when I started looking into this about 95 to this publication in 2022, Mm. right? Where I am absolutely convinced that there is a worldwide decline in sperm count. So let's take a breath and say, what else is going on? Right. And why is this going on? But you're the one asking the question, so I'm just going to stop here. And <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so those first studies, you basically found out that it, the sperm count was going down, and you need to start. You need to start looking for sort of things that you could correlate with the environment or with, that was basically beyond the lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you look at beyond lifestyle that could have a major impact on this? And what was like sort of the lowest hanging fruit that you noticed was having the most negative impact on sperm count and testosterone? We, testosterone is later. We didn't look at that until much later, but yeah. Um, But we should talk about that. Um, So, there really isn't any low-hanging fruit. It's all hard. Hmm. Because if I asked you, well, first of all, let me say, if you throw away lifestyle, because we have we know about that, and that's, you know, exercise and right. diet and smoking, smoking and alcohol. Right. And <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything, <basically>. <laughs> <laughs> everything, everything. That, everything that's fun. Everything that's fun. And, and by the way, the things that your doctor says you should worry about in terms of your heart health or your overall health also affects your sperm okay so that's i was shocked to see this like screens affect sperm that's that's kind of bizarre what staring at your phone or a tv or watching too much tv can yeah, affect your sperm that count was interesting yeah, yeah that that that's a danish study that i was involved in yeah that was pretty interesting being a couch potato actually right it's it's tied to that Sitting so you're down. watching your screen you're not outside exercising mm. you're not riding your bike you're okay. not right so it's so These are never it, one factor at a time. You it know? doesn't have so much to do with like the lights going into your retinas. It's more to do with like when people are connected to screens, they're sitting down, they're inactive. That's right. There now there is, I have to say, a lot of interest in the question of whether electromagnetic radiation from devices is affecting sperm count. And yes, like laptop use. When people put the laptops, they set it right on their crotch. Right, or in their po- the phone in their pockets. Yes, I'm not endorsing that or or dispro- you know discouraging it. I'm just saying this is now an active area of investigation. It needs to be looked at. Yes, because the exposure is huge. So if it has an effect, it's major. Right. 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 So um, 
let's go back before <laughs> electromagnetic radiation. And you asked what other factors? What was the low hanging fruit? Well, the problem is that if you put aside, by the way, genetics is not playing a role here. It's too fast. Two generations. 50 years, two generations, right. right? We can't get evolutionary change in two generations. So then it's environment. So what's environment? Lifestyle and others. But what's other mm -hmm. that's not your lifestyle? And that's really what you're asking. So there's chemicals of various kinds, which we'll come back to. And then there's things that are non-chemical, but not lifestyle. And they're kind of broad, actually. Could be heat, could be sound, could be radio <laughs> radio frequency mm -hmm. um, emissions and so on and so forth those are not chemicals per se but they're also not lifestyle right right okay so i'm going to put all that aside because it's not what i studied and go over to the chemicals so why chemicals well along with the increasing you know rate of infertility which we will talk about i'm sure and the decrease in sperm count at the same similar rates, there's been an increase in the um, chemical burden that people have. Okay, but it's huge. It's you know, eighty thousand chemicals. Yeah. So how do you know where to look? And so, since I was starting with reproduction, I wanted to think about chemicals that could affect reproduction, and a major player there are the chemicals that can interfere with the body's hormones okay Okay. because you know you know that testosterone matters for reproduction that estrogen matters these are steroid hormones okay and so if something could mess with that because that's so important for reproduction it could affect in principle could affect these things right so i began to look and others began to look at this class of chemicals which were called Endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs. By the way, that committee, remember that committee that I started out with? Yep. That committee was looking at those chemicals mm. all the way back in the mid 90s. Oh, wow. So this wasn't a new story, but it was a new way to look at them. And so I began to focus on the chemicals that could affect reproduction. And then a very lucky thing happened. <clears throat> I went to Japan which had a five-year big research effort on endocrine-disrupting chemicals. And I was sitting next to a chemist who was a friend. His name was John Brock. And he said, Shauna, you should look at phthalates. And I'm like, what? Why should I look at? What are they? <laughs> I Phthalate. Thought, Phthalates. What is that? What a funny word. It is a funny word, and I'd never heard of them. And um, so he said, well, first of all, we know through our you know studies at the CDC how to measure them and we've shown that they're in everybody oh, over 90% of people in their in the US samples that we had looked at they had looked at I wonder what the 10% of people who don't have phthalates in their blood who are those people yeah really <laughs> where, are they, where are they living <laughs> where, where <do> they live <laughs> right uh, probably that's a null set probably uh, anyway um, so he said phthalates and I said okay why you, do you care? And he said, well, and then he told me this story, which changed my life. He said that his colleagues at EPA and at the National Toxicology Program had been feeding phthalates to pregnant mice, rats, mm -hmm. rodents. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that the male offspring developed in a way that was not completely masculinized, not completely what you'd see in a genetic male who was not exposed. Okay. Okay? Okay. And this, they've studied this over and over and over again since they were, until they were really sure that they were, could do this repeatedly and which chemicals could do this. And then they published. And what they published was that when the mother, let's say rat, was exposed to a phthalate, let's just say, I'm going to give you a name, diethylhexyl phthalate, D-E-H-P, just so I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the most, the worst actor in this class <laughs> for lowering testosterone. Um, when the mother was exposed to that in early pregnancy, then her male offspring 
developed smaller penises, smaller scrotum, testes were less likely to descend, and there were internal changes as well, changes to the vas deferens, and, and so epididymis, and so on. Um, and this distance that they'd been measuring for years, but which I and no other epidemiologists had not heard about, the distance from the anus to the genitals became shorter. Mm. And they called it the phthalate syndrome. So this is the first syndrome that was named after a chemical that wow. a woman is exposed to in pregnancy. So and that this, these guys in Japan were the first ones to study it. Sorry, the the gentleman in Japan, uh, your colleague, the chemist. He was the he he. He was not a Japanese. He was an American. He okay. was at CDC. He was oh, an American. Oh, he was at CDC. And he he studied the chemistry. But the people who saw this and discovered this in rodents were Earl Gray and Paul Foster at the EPA and National Toxicology Program. Okay, wow. so they showed the phthalate syndrome, and then. I thought about this and I thought, well, what about us? Right. What about humans? John says we're all exposed to it. So what, do we see this in humans? So that became my next big project mm. of unraveling this mystery, right? Mm -hmm. By the way, in the, I'll tell you a couple of other, other things about rats. What Earl Grey said, AGD is forever. So if you have a small AGD, Anal sometimes genital called, distance, sometimes distance. called the taint or the gooch or yes. the grundle. <laughs> Very familiar with the gooch. Yeah, the three terms are better known than the technical scientific terms. Mm -hmm. But when, um, you know, th that distance is, is shorter um, when the mother has been exposed in this critical window, three days, three days, if the exposure is during days 18 to 21, they found that out later exactly, mm -hmm. then they'd get this whole syndrome. After 18 to 20 days after conception? Yes. Okay. Gestational day 18 to 21. Okay. And the analog in humans is not as specific. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know it's the first trimester. We know it's the early first trimester. Right. Okay. So I wanted to see, how do I look at this? Mm-hmm. So he, they had rats, they fed the rats, the phthalates. We can't do that. We can't feed pregnant women phthalates. Right. Right? No. That would be unethical. <laughs> That'd be unethical. Highly unethical. But remember the study for future families? The yes. first one? Yep. Okay, you remember I told you that we saved the woman's urine? Mm. How lucky was that? Right. Now we, now now we, we can go could, back. We can go back, get those samples, <clears throat> test them and see how much phthalate is in their urine wow. when they were pregnant. So that was just really fortuitous. And all my graduate students, I say, if you can collect urine, it's cheap, mm -hmm. it's easy to store, and it's going to turn out to be useful. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Right. So we had this urine. We sent it to John Brock and others at the CDC. And we said, tell us how many, th you know, which phthalates are in these women and how much. Mm -hmm. And there was a gradient. Okay. They all had it, but some had a little and some had a lot. And and then we, what are we going to do with that? We want to then relate it to the offspring genitals, right? Yes. So we had to get the kids. Of all of these people. All, these, all these people. Wow. To come in. And that was no easy task. Wow. But we got many of them. We didn't get them all, but we got many of them. How many, roughly? Oh, I, Gosh. Off the top of your head, you don't have to be exact. Yeah, we could look it up, but it's it was in the hundred. You know, it was like several hundred. Okay. I, yeah. Um, By the way, what is this graph, Stephen? This is uh, the common phthalates. Ah. Uh, in America, so for instance, over here, the green one is what what she was talking about, the DEHP. Right. Yes. And that's Okay, in Canada. Okay, oh, that's interesting. There's yeah. no DEHP on the east coast of the U.S. No, that maybe they didn't sample there. Okay, you know, but the, they have that big graph there. It says MEP. So uh, the, there's a bunch of red, like in the yeah. New York area. Yeah. And I, then MBP. Wow. And what is that little zoo? Okay, that's like okay, that's that's uh, like the Eastern Europe or the Western Europe. 
Yeah. There's a lot of uh, green. I, I actually don't believe there's anywhere there's no DEHP. Look at look at that giant spike right on like what is that Iran or Saudi Arabia? That giant one. Mm. Of ME, it's mostly MEP, which is red, and the MDEHP. So MEP, uh, monoethyl phthalate, is in personal care products, fragrance, skincare products, oh, makeup. Wow. That that's very nail polish. Nail polish, right? Okay. Yeah, MEP is a big player there. Um, it's not actually one of the worst actors in terms of being anti-androgenic, mm -hmm. but um, but the DEHP is is DHP the worst. DEHP is the worst, and then. Dibutyl phthalate, DBP, and BZP, benzyl butyl phthalate. Mm -hmm. And now what's interesting, there are new ones. We can talk about that process oh, afterwards. Wow. The new ones that are bad too, okay. coming out and being put in the market. So where were we? Yeah, where were we? So okay. we, I wanted to figure out. So John and others at CDC got the samples right, of the women. and did the measurements. And you got right? the children. And we got the children. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, how do you, what do you look at in the children? So it wasn't obvious what an AGD was in a child. We knew what it was in a rat. Okay. But what, it, what how, does he, how do you make that translation? So it took a while, a couple of pilot studies to actually figure out how to replicate the rat exam, if you will, yeah. to a, an infant exam. I worked with pediatricians and to develop this and set this up so we could do it reliably and repeatedly and consistently get the same thing every time which mm -hmm. you need for science and and once we figured out what that exam was going to be we brought the babies in and if the mothers agreed measured this syndrome markers of the right. syndrome in these children right right okay so we found it. We found the phthalate syndrome in humans. This means that the mothers with the higher levels of the anti-androgenic phthalates, particularly those three that I told you, were more likely to have a child with these symptoms and most markedly shorter gooch. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Right. And of course, I didn't use that in the publication, but <laughs> shorter, shorter AGG. <laughs> and um, that paper also made a huge impact. It made a huge impact scientifically, and lots of other people started measuring AGD, and also made an impact in terms of um, politics or actually public health because phthalates were then investigated mm. and included who investigated them the consumer protection act okay a uh, uh, consumer protection whatever committee that, committee yes thank you and um and i testified there and and they heard that and when they write their report they recommended that phthalates be taken out of children's products mm. and and they were in the Consumer Protection Act of 2008. Okay. So the paper came out in 2005, and we had this legislation. Now, I have to say, they were a little off the mark because the products that they banned these phthalates from were children's products. That's too late. That's, you get an A. Yeah. Yes. That's, First time ever. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. If they really should have been worrying about what the mother was exposed mm -hmm. to. So I think it's great that it came out of pacifiers and sippy cups and toys and rubber duckies. Important also, certainly continued exposure is not a good thing, but it did not protect the pregnant woman or the fetus. Right. Right? Anyway, this paper made a huge impact. Um, and then it left me with this question, and you've alluded to this, earlier which is who cares if you look you have two sons mm -hmm. if you looked and measured their agd mm -hmm. it could be big or smaller you wouldn't by eye see the difference it's not anything that jumps out at you it's not like the child looks weird right right it's just something you can measure okay okay and what is the proper measurement like what should it be depending uh, depending on age I, I is, is there a, is there an equation n no there is no proper measurement. It's because it's 
a f- function of body size and age. And so all of these measurements are adjusted. So, you know, how, like your height, a bit, child's height, you say, is that child very high at all? <laughs> yeah, well, they, child, it depends on their age, right? Right. right. And, and for, for something that's measured very close to birth, which we did in our next study, what's the, what's the gestational age? How developed were they? Right. When they, you know, so I, I don't want to, I mean, people could read the paper, they could read the book, but I don't want to have people going out and measuring their children's AGD and, and worrying about it. I don't want to do that. So like, for example, when you bring, when you have a newborn, you have to bring them in for like a three month, six month, nine month checkup, and mm-hmm. they give you a percentile of height, mm-hmm. head circumference, weight, and all that. Do they do that with age? They don't do that with AGD, obviously. Unfortunately, right? not. That's one of the things I really, really would like to see. I'd like to see this as a standard of care at the yeah. newborn exam. Yes. Just like you measure a kid's head circumference, you could measure their AGD. Exactly. And it would be simple, quick, and would give us unbelievable amounts of information. Right. Because what turns out, this little measure is kind of incredible. It tells us something about the past and something about the future. So I've told you a little about the past. It tells you about the mother's exposure to things that not only phthalates, but other things lower testosterone. So it tells you about what was the, what we call androgenic environment in the, in the womb. Mm-hmm. And by the way, it's relevant for girls too. We could mm-hmm. talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it also tells you about the future and that's the next step in this story. So when we said, who cares? Why does it matter? We were asking what, um, what does this have to do with fertility? What does it have to do with function? What does it have right. to do and with... Right, and what does it have to do with the, the life of that baby as he com- becomes an adult right. in general? In general, right. So we fast-forwarded and thought, well, okay, let's at least see, because we had, these children were very young. We couldn't see their function sexually, mm. <clears throat> but we could look at young men and... Earl Grey had told us that AGD is forever. If you adjust for height and body size, then if it's short, I told you it's short forever. So we thought, okay, so if a man in college has a short AGD, it's likely he was born with a short AGD. And does that, sorry to interrupt, does that also mean they have a small penis? Those are separate measurements, but they're correlated. They are and, correlated. And on, on average, the, expo- the phthalate syndrome in our study included a smaller penis. But so it, small balls, small, or testicles, sorry. Uh, uh, I want to be scientific but, here. But we didn't measure the length of the penis. We measured the width. The wi- Oh, interesting. Which Why you, was that? Because the length is variable. <laughs> and the width is not? No, not much. Not much. Okay. It's much more stable. Um, so that's the, that's what we measured anyway. So, th- so there's a strong correlation between the width of the penis and the length of the AGD. Yes. Okay. So I would say more directly, there's a correlation between yes. And also to the phthalate levels and the width of the penis. Okay. And the phthalate levels and the length of the AGD. Okay. Yeah. So we went to Rochester where I was living then university and we put up posters and I had a wonderful postdoc working with me who took charge of the study, um, Jaime Mendiola, and he ran the study and he got these volunteers to come in and give a semen sample and let us measure their HED and complete a questionnaire. Okay. Okay. And they were very, you know, wonderful and helpful and one of them said well for 75 dollars i'll give you anything because <laughs> that's what we paid them. oh nice <laughs> yeah. and and so um what we found or jamie found jaime is his spanish name um that the longer the well let's start with the sperm count the lower the sperm count the shorter the hd mm. the longer the hd the higher the sperm count Correlation, linear correlation. Right. Right. Okay. Linear relationship. And then we couldn't ask about fertility in that population because these were college students. But in California, a colleague named Mike Eisenberg 
looked at men in an infertility clinic and did this a similar thing. And he got their sperm count and he got their HED and he showed that, again, that it was related, HED and sperm count were related, okay. but also that fertile men had a longer HED than men who hadn't delivered a child. It stands to reason. Mm. So when people say, who cares? I say, everyone should care because that measurement tells you something about the future, not only about the past, what was in the womb, but in the future, how that boy is going to function. Mm. Right? Right. Right. So let me stop there. And you also said there was a correlation between how soon they hit puberty, right? Or was that only in women? Um, so that's not a correlation directly with phthalates. That's okay. another, um, that is women primarily. And that is a whole other line of work, which maybe we shouldn't get into the, mm-hmm. today, but it's very, very important and interesting um, okay. that the age of puberty in women is dropping most markedly, apparently, in African-American women. Okay. And we don't know why. So you you did a very good job in the book of just explaining to me how during development, the baby's sort of like sexual reproductive organs are made. You basically explained there's uh, a certain time where testosterone has an opportunity to kick in, which creates this certain area on the human groin area, the human groin that develops in the testes or not. Right. And it seems like when these phthalates are introduced, it stunts the growth of that area specifically. Correct. And that's re- very well put. So let me just back up and say, before, let's leave phthalates out of it. Okay. Just in every baby. In very early pregnancy, the male and the female genitals are the same. Right? Right. The, they... You can't separate them. You don't see ovaries. You don't see testes. You don't see penis. You know, they're just, it's actually just a ridge of tissue. Okay. Okay. And then at the critical time, which we know in rats specifically, we don't know specifically in humans, but it's early pregnancy, the testes start to form. And that's genetically programmed in an XY individual, Mm -hmm. right? And so they start to form. And as they, at a certain point, they're able to produce testosterone, and they do that, okay, in the genetic male. Female also, but just a little bit, mm-hmm. but mostly much more in the male. Okay, so what they showed in these animal studies is that when the mother was given th- phthalates in her food, at that time, when the testosterone is surging, that the surge is wiped out. It's mm. eliminated. The graph is very dramatic. Right. It just completely flat in males, genetic males. So that says that that male needs that testosterone at that time to develop normally. Okay? Okay. Okay. And so the f- default, if he doesn't get it, that genital tract will remain the default, which is female. Right. Okay? Okay. So the degree to which it differentiates from the female, you know, so the development of the testes and the, instead of the ovaries and the development of the penis instead of the clitoris and so on and so forth, that the degree that that separation takes place is dependent upon this hormonal surge. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. And there's a large variation uh, in how developed the genitals can be with these babies. Right. That's correct. And how, so... In your book, you described um, the this lady, Tracy, and her son, Bar- Barry, who was a boy who identified as a girl. Um, what sort of correlation did you find with children, specifically with gender dysphoria, and as it relates to sort of like a, it seems like a, a more recent surge with transgender, the transgender movement. I know there's no actual evidence that there's been no real studies done on it, but what was your take on that? And did you, do you suspect there is a connection? So first of all, in terms of our studies, we did not study that. We did not have children. We did not get information on sexual identity from children. That is an important study and it should be done. And that should be related to, 
chemicals that they were exposed to. Mm. Um, but that has not been done. I my th- suspicion is that just as the generals differentiate into male and female, the brain also does. And we know that there are, for example, you know, men, this is a stereotype, okay? And it's a social stereotype. And so it's very politically very difficult. But there are certain things like socialization seems to be easier for females and um, uh, spatial uh, ability to manipulate things spatially, which is testosterone dependent, seems to be stronger in genetic males. That's testosterone dependent? Like, spatial, like yeah. visual spatial recognition. Yes, yes. You ask men to rotate a figure in space in their minds; they can do that and much more quickly and easily than females. That's really? A, yeah, that's a throughout th- life or only in early no, like, I, puberty. I, I, it's not. I don't know. Okay, but my understanding is it's throughout life. Okay, yeah, not early puberty. I don't. So in any case, there there is a different. There's no question. There's a diff- some differences in the development of the brain, and that these are governed by in part by testosterone as well as the genitals. So it it's very conceivable to me that possibly the surge of chemicals which can impact the body's hormones might be doing something somewhat different in the brain and in the genitals. So it, it, it you know they mm-hmm. they could have maybe no little effect on on the genitals and the and physiologically the child could be male typical if he's a genetic male but perhaps the surge to the brain has limited the development in that direction right so this is just a wild hypothesis and maybe totally wrong but i believe that these changes that are important and hormonally driven are happening in utero and i so i think that Whatever we find as we go down the road uh, for gender dysphoria and uh, is going to relate to exposures mm. in utero. That's the only hypothesis I have. Whether it's going to be due to a specific chemical or a class of chemicals or not. And let me just say that this whole area is very difficult because it's difficult for trans people and I totally understand that because it it medicalizes mm-hmm. their identity. Mm-hmm. It says, why are you like this? And we don't ask that generally, you know, about, you know, and, and, and it's similar concerns for people who have other atypical development, for example, ASD people and so on, right. you know, what causes that? Well, I'm not sure that that question is... F- Yet we've learned how to phrase that question in a way that does not make people feel that the way they are is the way they should not be. Right. And I don't want to give that impression. Well, right. But it seems like it. at the same time, it's very important to study, especially when it relates to some of these chemicals that are in our everyday world. You know, and when, when you talk about specifically the development of the sexual organs being stunted in utero and these babies being born with ambiguous genitalia, not necessarily 100 percent developed with testosterone or not 100% developed testicles or dropped testicles, you could imagine how that would translate to somebody being, or the way people describe, I feel like people say they're a male in a woman's body or a woman in a male's body, that I can see a connection there. But the thing is you can't study because you can't ask rats how they feel. You can't ask a rat, you know, what do you feel like? Do you feel masculine or feminine? Right, right. So it's, it's, I'm definitely curious about that. I think we're all curious about that. Yeah. And I think um, maybe, you know, animal toxicologists will find some clever way to figure out what uh, an animal's preference is. Mm. <laughs> you know, they can certainly already find out who that rat wants to have sex with. And they can produce rats, and as I told you, that want to have males want to have sex with other males. Really? Yes. Yes. That can be produced with the pesticide we talked about before, atrazine. Right. And this was a study that was done on fish and frogs as well, right? Right. 
Frogs, particularly, well, yeah. Frogs. Right. Oh, yes. They made homosexual frogs. And, right. 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 So that that is possible. But what that has to do with gender dysphoria is a really open question and one that I think is very delicate and we have to be careful about even asking mm. without offending people. Yeah. I think, honestly, that we need some trans people to come in and do this research because they will do it sensitively and they'll understand what the concerns are. Mm. And as... Um, non-trans, you know, non-binary person, uh, I'm afraid I'm, you know, at risk of sticking my foot in it, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and, and saying things that will offend people. And so I'm being really careful. Yeah. Um, and um, maybe you could have somebody on your show who's trans and would talk about it. Yeah, well, it's hard, you know, because serious academics like yourself, they don't want to talk about it because it's there's a very big risk of people coming after you or trying to discredit you in any way and uh you know it, the, the problem with it is it is it does stifle discussion and research like you just said you don't want to touch it and that's a problem i think you know no I, I, I didn't say i didn't want to touch it i said i didn't want to talk about it now because i don't know right i can just tell you this a study that i think would be relevant and that oh, i okay. think should be done right and that's what I always do. I always design, mm -hmm. think, oh, how would we do this? And then I do it, right? Right. But this one is going to be hard. But it could be done. And there are databases in Europe and the United States where um, urine has been stored mm -hmm. from a long time ago. And you could test that urine for environmental chemicals like phthalates or whatever, the bisphenols. We haven't talked about other classes, you know, mm -hmm. pesticides and so on. And then you could see... If you have a very large sample, how their children developed and what percent of them were trans right. or opted that took that option or considered that option, they're probably mm -hmm. a gradient um, and see <clears throat> whether the exposure correlated with the behavior in, say, the adolescent years uh, around sexual identity. Mm. That study would really be valuable here yes the problem is that like i said asking that question and it's writing it's controversial mm -hmm. and and i'm afraid that you know it, w it will take a very open-minded funding agency or yeah. you know to say we want it, we're interested in this we want to fund this we want to find this out right um but i'm not against studying it i'm just right. against talking about it in ignorance mm. and talking about it without the participation of the affected people mm -hmm. um it, you know we can't always do that we can't always include the affected population in our design of our study our conduct of our study but the extent that we can i think we're being more and more sensitive to yeah. people's needs so that's what I would like to see. I would like to see. I actually know one person who's an epidemiologist who's trans, and and she would be great to, oh, yeah. to work on this. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I, I think that will happen, but I don't have the answer now. Do you think there's any correlation with the gender dysphoria and things like anxiety or depression? I've read some that there is, and certainly um, gender dysphoria people are uh, under considerable social pressure and stressors, so I wouldn't be surprised mm -hmm. if <laughs> there wasn't more anxiety. And, and being uh, prescribed things like uh, antidepressants and stuff. That I, I don't know that, those data, but I, would, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Let's put it like that. Yeah. The pharmacology and, and the medicine, and specifically the antidepressants, they seem to be an issue. Like, I'm not an expert on it, but I know that a lot of, more and more young people that I talk to every day are on uppers and downers. You know, they're on antidepressants or on stimulants, such yeah. as like Adderall or whatever, to, right. to study and to get through school and to get work done. Are you talking about trans people? Or? No, no, just in general. Oh, just, in, in general. just young people in general. Oh, not specific trans people, but... Yeah. Right. I mean, but I imagine if you combine the two, right? Yeah. It's got to be. It's got to be a cascading effect. It's got to just make yeah. it worse. If you're already dealing with this feeling of gender insecurity or dysphoria, and you comp compound that with things like depression and anxiety because of it and cu cultural stigmas, um, difficult. Not a good combo. Yeah. Let's talk about testosterone. Did we okay. talk about testosterone yet? I don't think yeah. we did. Yeah. So how does this? How does uh, testosterone? Where does that come into the picture with all of this? Well, obviously, testosterone is very key here um, for um, it's it's important for the 
production, you know, the development of the testes, the production of sperm. Mm -hmm. Um, And by the way, now that more and more young men are seeking testosterone treatment. Mm. um, Yeah, we talked about this yesterday, too. (laughs) I'm concerned because they're not going to have adequate sperm when they get around to having a right a child Mm -hmm. um so yeah so i've been on some of these online reddit forums that talk about testosterone Mm -hmm. and it's a it's a i don't know if you're familiar with reddit but it's it's basically like a website where people can go and just talk about any topic and there it gets deep it gets into the weeds um but there's lots of kids on there and like the bodybuilding communities who are in their early teens early late teens early 20s that are a lot of them even some not but some getting their blood work done beforehand and having abysmal testosterone levels they're Mm -hmm. talking about how their testosterones are in like the one to two hundreds uh nanograms per deciliter which is on the like the very very bottom of the scale um that the cdc recommends and these guys getting on testosterone because it's like what's like what's the trade-off like do i start testosterone therapy and feel great feel like a normal person and be able to go to the gym and feel be healthy and sacrifice not being able to have kids like it's a very it's a very heated sort of topic because it's so there's an obvious trade-off to doing that but there's a huge advantage to doing it too because you feel so good when they they, people feel so good when they do it yeah so the only the information i have about testosterone which is increasing as i study this more is that it is declining just as sperm count is declining Mm -hmm. and probably at a comparable rate Mm -hmm. and because we know that many environmental chemicals have the ability to lower testosterone, it's very plausible that that's why this is happening, mm-hmm. right? Right. But that doesn't actually prove it. We have to do something similar, you know, that we did with, um, for example, in those Rochester young men. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just getting an idea here. We might be able to do this. What can we do? We could maybe, if we have those samples still stored, measure the testosterone, which we didn't do, in those young men and relate it to their mother's phthalates, which we did measure. Mm-hmm. Right. Remember I told you that yeah. we... Yeah. And, wow, maybe we've just started a study here. Oh, wow. <laughs> we got your next book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really, really interesting. Or maybe not in these men, but some population where we knew... You know, prenatal exposure, because I do think that that's where it's happening. Mm -hmm. And then we have measured testosterone, maybe at several points in a young man's life, to see whether there's a relationship. So that's, I give that out to people as if they were listening, who they can, if they can do a study, they could contact me and we'll work on it together. (laughs) Yes, we'll include your contact information below for people to uh, email you. Um, So testosterone. Sperm count is declining currently by two and a half percent per year. How do you know what the number is for testosterone? How how what the number is? How that's declining per year? The the study no, and the studies on testosterone are not recent. They're mm-hmm. not as recent as the ones in sperm. That little upgrade we did and with that new, yes. yeah, we haven't done that for testosterone. Okay, so we will. We will do that. And then I can come back and tell you the answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. So t- testosterone is, is very much linked to cardiovascular health, cognitive function, many things. Yes. And by the way, so is sperm count. Really? Yes. I thought sperm count was just because of te- it was tied to testosterone. That's hard to separate, isn't it? Because yeah. they're intimate. It's one that c- kind of confounding we were talking about. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you that there's a number of studies now that show that men with low sperm count have more cardiovascular disease, have more diabetes, have more reproductive cancers, and die younger. Interesting. So it's a marker of overall health, Mm -hmm. right? As is infertility, as is women's infertility, by the way. Mm. So all of these things are not, you know, they don't stand alone. It's part of a, a mixed, you know, a complicated picture where they're all interrelated. Right. Yeah. I wonder if you had a if you had somebody who went through like a young boy who went through chemotherapy and that killed all his sperm 
and he wasn't able to produce sperm anymore. Because I know that happens to young boys, like right. kids who go through chemo. They, right. they they're infertile after yeah. that. I wonder if that is tie. If that's the same. If it still correlates to a shorter lifespan or lo- shorter or worse cardiovascular health. Yeah. Because of that. Great question. Or if it has to be. Through You're the just environment. designing all these studies here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very it's a very good question. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I I have a friend, a young man who uh, did go through um, chemo as a child for for cancer and he did bank some sperm mm-hmm. um and oh he, really yeah and he was told that he was azospermic had no n- no sperm in the Zero. sample but in fact he did conceive a child oh really yeah how does that how did that happen well they they missed it counting is not a you know you can't be guaranteed of counting every um sperm and he had some left so and even if you have one it's a, there's a chance it's possible it's possible, and he lucked out. Um, and he is very well and healthy, and you know, I'm happy to say. Yeah. So it is not an absolute. Who was the name? Oh, I'm sorry, we talked about him last night. Who was the name of the gentleman who did the studies on the frogs that turned the frogs homosexual? Tyrone Hayes. Tyrone Hayes. Okay, and he's at Berkeley. He's right? at Berkeley. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And he uh, and what are the specific chemicals that he induced into these frogs? He studied atrazine. Atrazine. And yeah. atrazine, that's... That's the one that we showed was related to sperm count. Right, in man. exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about glyphosate and, yeah. round, and Roundup. Yeah. What specifically did you find out about, about glyphosate and Roundup? So surprisingly, glyphosate, Roundup, have been one of the most poorly studied pesticides out there. And given that it's the wi- most widely used pesticide in the world, you know, make, makes you wonder why. But... Um, there are now studies going on, and we have some pilot data showing that glyphosate exposure does affect um, intergenital distance. But mm-hmm. in these studies, which are small, and I won't you know, put a lot behind this, these were the f- females that were affected. Okay. And they had longer AGD. Longer AGD. And so they were more masculine. Yes. Interesting. Which So a chemical can be anti-androgenic, knock down androgens, knock down testosterone, or it can be pro-androgenic, increase testosterone. So anything that increases testosterone will make girls in a gentle distance, gooch, longer, more in the male direction because they're getting more testosterone, right? Mm, right. Right. Can that happen to men too? No, because they're already so high that the amount okay. that can be increased by an exposure will be, won't, okay. will, you know, won't right. matter, right? But but if you're very low and you get an increase, it could double your mm. exposure. You see, right? And so, but this is very very tentative, and this is an area of very, you know, current study that people mm. are looking at the effects of glyphosate. Um, in various ways, one, you know, on the microbiome, on, you know, obesity, right. on lots and lots and lots of things. It's one of the hot new topics in the field. Yes. And, it, you know, it, it it seems like all of this is you can bucket, put it all in the same bucket of our problem with trying to make everything convenient. And one mm-hmm. of the one of the big problems with glyphosate and the Roundup is like. They used to spray the crops and just spray the weeds individually. And now what they do, if they've they, they developed this thing called corn ready roundup. Have you mm-hmm, heard of that? Mm-hmm. Where they basically just take an airplane and they coat acres and acres of farmland with this roundup and it even gets all over the corn crops. But some for some reason, it only kills the weeds and doesn't affect the corn. Hmm. So basically, our this stuff is coated in these chemicals. Oh, wow. That's not good. Scary. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah. And they and you know, this just goes back to they're doing that because it's convenient. It probably saves them money. But how 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 do we turn the ship? Like all these massive plastic and chemical companies that I'm sure have billions of dollars and have lobbying behind them. How do you, we convince them that this is a problem? And how do we convince them to to leave billions of dollars on the table and you know, from their perspective, they're like, okay, we'll have, you know, thousands of thousands of people unemployed and p- potentially collapse our corporate empires for a benefit that will only be seen a hundred years from now, potentially, right? Three generations or more than a hundred years. Um, I think benefits will be seen more quickly. Um, I think that he, what might turn the tide is some specific individuals 
who have personal concerns. So some powerful person who has unable to have grandchildren or they are unable to have a child or, you know, or they see um, various, you know, problems related to these exposures in their family, in themselves. I think, I mean, that's why people donate money. <laughs> you know, they right. do, m- many donors are right. don- donating because of their own personal experience. Right. So, I don't know. I mean, that that might be one way to, you know, so as we get this information out to more and more people, hopefully more people will be concerned. So there's a couple of things. One is you can take personal action, and that's good, and I definitely recommend it. And you know in the book there's a couple of chapters about things you can do, and we can talk about that. Mm-hmm. And I'm not putting those down at all. Those are very important. And also make us feel that we're doing something, which we are. We can take um, political action by, you know, sending letters. and But that's, nobody wants to do that. that no. Right? Nobody wants to send a letter. <laughs> so, realistically, I don't po- know. More podcasts about it. More podcasts, maybe we'll get, do something. Um, I think the first thing is that people have to know that this is a problem. As Joe Rogan said, why don't we know about this? Right. Right? Right. And that's why I'm talking to everybody I can so that people know about it. Um, I think that's what happened with climate. So originally there were, you know, scientists and others that were speaking, you know, very forcefully about climate, but they weren't being heard. Mm. And then, partially through personal experience of hurricanes, floods, whatever, people became more concerned, Mm -hmm. personally concerned. Mm -hmm. And then they began to take more action. We started out by saying... But even that, like, just look what's happened with climate. It's just all it's become is just this political football and this polarizing effect. You know, nothing gets done. People just like to fight about it. Yeah. Click on on news articles about it. I know. It's... it's, But, and by the way, our problem... I hope that doesn't happen with this. Right. Our problem here that I'm talking about today is maybe people don't know this, but the chemicals in plastic are made from petroleum byproducts. Mm. So it's not really a separate problem from climate change. Interesting. And and one of my concerns and concerns of many people in the field that as we start pulling, you know, making fuel and and for homes and cars and so on out of other products other than fossil fuels, then those resources will have to go somewhere and they'll go into more plastic. In other words, that changing the source of our energy away from fossil fuels will put increase the problem with plastics. Um, changing it away from fossil fuels? Yes. As we, as a society, say, okay, we're going to go to clean energy. We're going right. to go, to, right? right? So we're not going to use fossil fuels. Well, right. what's going to happen to those fossil fuels? Right, and they can be put into plastics, and so there'll be more the, economically. They have to go somewhere, and and or not oh, be. Oh, I see what you're you saying. See? I see what you're saying. So, so they're out there, and their use probably will increase as in these areas, mm-hmm. household products and so on, as we decrease. And that's who knows. That's a speculation. Mm-hmm. Okay, but um, it's a concern of mine mm-hmm. um, that. You know, it's just another way that we're dependent on fossil fuel. Mm. So when it comes to plastics, though, how can people who are living their everyday lives and, you know, don't have the money to completely change their living situation or every single piece of Tupperware and dish and thing in their house and thing, everything they interact with, all their products, like what is a what is like a, a, a rational sort of logistical way somebody can avoid some of the worst exposures to these phthalates and to these chemicals. I, I told you I got rid of all my plastic baby bottles for my kid. I made my wife throw them all away and we got glass ones. That was great. But that was not great. everyone can do that. Right. So um, food, to the extent that you can, if you can eat unprocessed food, like carrots in a bunch yeah. or lettuce in a head even if it's wrapped in plastic because a lot of carrots come wrapped in plastic yeah that's true i 
there so the, the, here's the thing about chemicals leaving the plastic if they're warm or if there's liquid it's more likely the mm. if the environment is warm or liquid it's more likely for the phthalates to or the bisphenols to leave the the plastic right so um carrots i'm not so worried um but if you go to a farmer's market, if you're lucky enough to go to a farmer's market, you can just buy it from the farmer. Okay. That would be the ideal, I would say. Um, I think I told you yesterday about an experiment where they took this farm and some of the cows were milked by hand and some of the cows mm-hmm. were milked by a milking machine. And the cows that were milked by hand had no phthalates in their milk and farmers that in, and those cows that were milked by the milking machine, that milk had phthalates in it. Mm. So it's really hard to know, you know, how to how to avoid them. If you go to buy a, a container of milk, even if it says organic on it, that could have been processed through a yes. milking machine. Yes. We don't know that. Yeah, I mean, it's ridiculous if you walk through the grocery store, all the labels that are on every single product. I mean, the FDA doesn't pay attention to all that stuff. No. So, so you were asking me some simple things people can do. So I would say... Um, if you can afford it, eat organic, because a food being organic n- keeps out most pesticides. Phthalates are, by the way, also in pesticides as an um, inert ingredient, um, because they increase absorption mm-hmm. of the phthalate into the plant. Um, and in general, organic food is produced more carefully with respect to environmental risks okay? okay so i would say if you can afford it and not everyone can that you would you know buy organic food or buy it from a farm <laughs> or buy it from a farmer ideally a farmer's market or something but and and try to avoid fast food mm. because these tend to be ultra processed and full of huge numbers of chemicals again that's an economic thing some people just have to you know right. grab a meal at the end of a huge long day you know yeah. and but um, so then in the home, besides food, we talked about this, but there's, it would be good to treat your water because we now know that water contains lots and lots of micro and nanoplastics. Mm-hmm. And um, I would prefer not to drink that myself. So I distill my water and I know you use a reverse osmosis. Those are both very good ways of treating mm-hmm. your water. You can also get a filtration system, which is a little more problematic because you have to change the filter and so on. But um, don't buy water in plastic bottles if you can avoid it. Right. Right. So, especially when those plastic bottles have been sitting in a car or somewhere. Right. Or, or in a right. Truck. Don't. Right. <laughs> don't leave water in plastic bottles in your car. Um, and then, as far as air. Our ambient environment, our air, is full of these microplastics wow. and nanoplastics. So HEPA filter is, is pretty effective. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that's effective is to just some, leave your shoes at the door. Then you're not bringing in those particles from the outside into okay. your home. And vacuum with a HEPA filter. So, so try to keep your air clean. It, you know, so these things come in every which way, through inhalation, through ingestion, that's mm. eating and drinking, and dermal. So the dermal is your skincare products, makeup, sunscreen. You can worry about what's in those. Mm. Um, and we don't have a completely perfect way of screening those. Environmental Working Group does a good job, and um, they have a consumer guide to personal care products Mm. and cleaning products by the way also contain a lot of these chemicals so i i would say going to some of the guides we suggest in the book or you know some of we haven't suggested that you can hunt for on the web right try to buy products that have been screened to some extent none very thoroughly i would say but to some extent to be free of the these chemicals now you talked about how you dist- can you walk me through how you distill your water and what how how that's done sure mm. sort of i mean i i can't tell you the actual mechanics of the machine right but like is there a certain thing that you bought somewhere or well, yeah i bought a distiller that's called a distiller yeah okay where'd you buy it um on the web 
Okay. Can you, you know? search for distillers? We can maybe look at them. I'm curious. I, I would put, Do if they you don't mind, ca- uh, countertop distillers. Countertop distillers. Yeah, because you don't want something that's going to be huge for a business or, you know, but countertop, home distillers. Okay. Yeah. Oh, one of these, is one of these just sits on the counter? Yeah, the one on the left is actually what I have. That one. Yeah. But it doesn't mean it's the best. It's just right. one. And that's how it works. You, you just so, fill it up. Let's read that. By the way, I don't want to be endorsing any particular brand here, but just say that... No, this, yeah, yeah. We yeah. just clicked on the first one we saw. Yeah. So, you know, it, you put it in at night, it drips out, it <laughs> evaporates, mm-hmm. condenses, comes into that pitcher, a glass pitcher, and then in the morning, I just pour that water into two glass pitchers that we keep in the mm-hmm. fridge. It's wonderful tasting okay. water. And then my husband cleans it out. And by the way, what's left, I live in San Francisco, the water's good, but what's left after we pour out, you know, after it's been distilled, the residue doesn't smell great. I bet. Ugh. And so we cleaned it out with vinegar and then we're ready for the next batch. So right. we do that every couple of days. I've seen some of those water treatment. I have a friend who uh, builds the water treatment tanks that are for like different cities. Mm. And they basically like filter all the... Mm toilet water for all of the cities and it goes into this giant tank it's like yeah. bigger than a aquarium at SeaWorld. Yeah. and it they pour like tons of chemicals and stuff in there and filter it out and that gets all siphoned out to, to our drinking supply which is like nasty right what could be in there right those chemical those things are probably full of phthalates and they're probably pouring roundup in there for all we know <laughs> oh i'm sure and 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 pharmaceuticals as well right right, right? Oh, it's disgusting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's that's a good choice. And no. I don't know. Do you want to say anything about RO? Yeah. 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 What is RO? Reverse osmosis, isn't it? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know anything about it. I oh, just okay. I just bought one because I heard they were good. Yeah. I got it installed. It's like these. <laughs> there's like these three filters that are installed under there, and the the water travels through all of it. It's very complicated, but it makes the water taste better for sure. It so, tastes. There's a stark difference. I can tell the difference between the tap water and that water. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and um. An interesting little experiment, which would not be hard, would be to compare, take the same source and pass it through a distiller, an RO, and a home filter, Mm. and then blindly ask people which they prefer and test them for chemicals. Mm. That would be a- That would be a great test. A great, Mm. simple experiment. And Um, you could test it against liquid death, mountain water. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Not in plastic. You know, uh, I think it's like 70% of all recycled plastic goes into landfills. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. It is not. It, it makes people feel like they're doing the right thing, which is, you know, unfortunate because, in fact, they're not doing anything helpful. Make sure I'm right on that. Can you see if it is 70%? I'm curious what it actually is. I think it's close to 70%, though. Where does this go for humanity generation, generationally? Like, <sighs> if we can't start turning the ship now, right? If we're, we're staying on the trajectory we're on right now, where do you see this going in 50 to 100 years? Well, first of all, you know, I... Okay, it's 79%. Only 9% has been recycled. The vast majority is 79%. And you mentioned in your book, so that okay, so the seventy nine percent goes into landfills. But you mentioned in your book, there's this giant floating island in the middle of the ocean that's the size of Texas, right? Yeah, yeah. That's all just plastic junk. I think that's pretty well known. That's the Great yeah, Garbage Patch. The great Garbage Patch. Yeah, yeah. and um, people have seen probably are tired of seeing all these animals, fish, turtles, with plastic around their neck, and mm-hmm. you know. Uh, the the impact yeah. of these chemicals on um, the environment on wildlife is tragic, but you were saying where where do I see this going? I just yeah. want to say I think I I am an optimist at heart, and so I have hope that we can once alarmed enough make changes that will really move the needle, and I think we we d- did that. After COVID came out and we desperately needed a vaccine quickly, Do you know? and it was produced faster than 
any vaccine had ever been produced, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that what we need is alarm. We need concern. We need pressure to get governments and philanthropists and, you know, people that have the resources to do this to say this is a moonshot this is the moonshot we have to take we have to make alternative forms of plastic we have to get people to clean up their personal and you know environment and in animal studies in three generations full fertility can be restored we don't have three generations because for an animal, three generations is six years. A rat? For a rat, right? Okay. If you're a rat, you've got six years. Three so generations. Two years is the li lifespan of a rat. Okay. Yeah. And for us, our life, you know, we have intergenerational is 25 years. So we have, we have to look out 75 years. Okay. At the rate at which sperm count and other things are declining, it's probably not enough time. I think we have to clean it up faster than that the other thing that gives me hope is that um we have alternative ways of conceiving and and more and more of those are you know artificial insemination and assisted reproduction in general mm -hmm. has developed tremendously and i think that we will continue to do that we'll get more and more techniques for reproducing mm -hmm. which will be not the typical way of reproducing for that to happen, people have to want children. And that's something that worries me a lot. We talked about this a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, in many parts of the world, the uh, desire to marry, to um, have children, is decreasing also. I haven't looked at the rate, but it's pretty dramatic in some countries. And Yeah, specifically um, like Singapore and Korea. S South Korea, Singapore, Japan. Um so for the species to maintain itself, we have to have 2.1 children for every couple in their lifetime. Okay? 2.1 children for every couple. Yeah. Man, woman, replace themselves, and a little bit extra because there's some loss. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's called the replacement rate for total fertility. And we're below that, and we're dropping and that's gone down about 50% in 50 years also, just like sperm count and just, wow. right? And some, so look, think about 2.1. That's where you wanna be if you want to keep the species replacing itself. Mm -hmm. South Korea is now at 0 0.83. And other Eastern Asian countries are around one. China's got a big problem. And China has a big problem. And here's the thing. People don't want, apparently, to have more children. Th these countries yep. are giving economic mm -hmm. incentives for people to have more children, and they're not buying it. So, I don't know. I don't know what will turn that around. And, and, and economically, countries are recognizing that if you don't have enough children, you won't have the middle of the population pyramid to support the old people right. who are increasing. Right. And you have economic chaos, really. <laughs> yeah, it's like we talked about earlier, when it comes with culture, I, like, I personally see younger people, my generation and younger, they're, when you ask them why they don't have kids, they're just like, oh, I wanna wait till I'm rich. Or I wanna wait till I get my life figured out. Or when I want to get my career figured out. A lot of people I know don't even, you know, in their mid thirties haven't ever, you know, 30s and even 40s have never even considered having kids yet because they they aren't where they are financially to have kids. And I think that uh, what you were also alluding to is that there's a societal thing that's happening happening with with women in in particular that are finding more and more successful careers in you know various industries or whatever it might be that they don't want to necessarily raise children. They want to have successful careers. And they right. think maybe I'll do that after. But they don't right. realize that you can't do that after. I think. Why? That and, and then you look at people, sorry, but then 
um, you have like uh, Courtney Kardashian yep. who just came out as uh, she's pregnant with her. I think it's her fourth child with uh, Travis Barker and she's like 45 years old. So people think, oh, Courtney Kardashian did it. I can do it too. Right, right. And they some can, but it's much more difficult. And the pregnancies are more complicated. Um, and actually, parental age is a risk factor for lots of <laughs> um, bad outcomes later in life, mm. which is interesting. For example, older parents have more um, autistic children. If I remember correctly, it's mid twenties. There's a one in eight hundred chance of having that chromosome number twenty one. I think it is Down syndrome, mm -hmm. and then above thirty, it increases to like one in one hundred. Yeah, yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah, so so postponing childbirth is risky. It's risky because maybe you won't conceive. Because as women age, they have fewer and fewer eggs that are available mm. for you know, usable eggs, and high, more chances of um, chromosomal abnormalities in the sperm. And so more chances for failure of that pregnancy. Mm. And by the way, we didn't talk about this, but um, if you look at um, couples going for assisted reproduction mm -hmm. um, and test their urine, and that's the man and the woman, the presence of a number of these EDC chemicals in the urine affects the success of that attempt to conceive that pregnancy. Wow. The, the embryo quality, the number of embryos retrieved, the embryo quality, no, I'm sorry, the number of eggs retrieved, the embryo quality, the implantation rates, and the birth rates are all affected by the chemicals in the parents. Mm. And that's a study out of many studies out of Harvard, all out of what's called the Earth Study, mm -hmm. and other people are looking at that too. But it's it's not just affecting the fetus in utero, it's affecting the fetus before it gets there, if you will. It's not a fetus, it, you know, it's an embryo. But um, Infecting the eggs. Affecting the eggs, affecting the sperm, affecting what after they've been put together, uh, and even affecting the embryo, even after it's been implanted. So there's there's risks all along the way um, for the failure of, of this process. I love the fact that you're optimistic, but I don't see how we're gonna be able to fix it. I don't, I don't see, I hope it does, but it's gonna take a lot, a lot of these podcasts and it's gonna take really shaking up the, shaking up the hornet's nest to try to get people to get off their ass and take some action here. Yeah. Got to keep trying. We have to keep trying. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is there anything we missed that we that we should talk about? Yeah. I would like to just say that it's not just humans, right? right. So, I mean, there are, there's a lot of information on declines of multiple species, uh, insect decline, insect Armageddon, bird decline, you know that, you know right. what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, now there are studies that showing even sperm count in in horses and dogs has been declining as well as mm. humans. So, of course, animals living in the environment or domestic animals are going to be exposed, those domestic animals, those dogs and so on, to the same air that we are and the same water that we are. And mm. probably they have a lot of the stuff in their food that I've never analyzed, mm -hmm. but... Um, <clears throat> and the alligators in, in Lake Apopka. And the, in the wildlife, like the alligators in Lake Apopka that were um, producing smaller and smaller litters, and by the way, having smaller anal genital distance. Mm -hmm. um, and smaller penises. Smaller penises, right. Penal size, that was the first thing that Lou Gillette showed, was that alligators in Lake Apopka had a smaller penis. Lake Apopka was contaminated by pesticides. So that was, how? when was that? It was like... In the 90s, I think? Yeah, I think that's yeah. what you said, yeah. yeah. And and so this is not a new story, and it's not just a human story. That's that's a point that I don't think I talked about and we didn't get into, but it's a planetary problem. Right. Right. But it's because of us. A large part of it is because of us, yes. That's I won't good. rule out that <clears throat> there are some other forces that are <clears throat> changing, you know, Mm -hmm. But um, right. certainly we see direct relationship, as in Lake Apopka, mm -hmm. between the pollution and the 
fertility of that species, the mm. ability of that species to, to survive. Mm. And I think everyone knows about species decline, the number of species that are declining and or endangered. And actually, um, we are as well endangered. Is there anything specifically with marine life that we're seeing like a decline in other than like alligators that are in lakes and stuff like that, but like in the oceans that like we talked about um, how specifically here in Florida, there's all these sugar plantations that mm -hmm. the pesticides are running off and they're creating this giant algae bloom that happens here in Florida every year where it basically kills off hundreds and thousands of fish and wildlife that all wash up on the beach and create this there's your answer smell isn't it on the, on the beach yeah yeah <laughs> you've answered your own I question i did answer my own question <laughs> but I, I but i wonder if there's any been any sort of people like looking at this on a large like on a on a macro scale with red tides and things like this or are there any things that we're missing probably but i don't know mm -hmm. i don't have that information i do know that there's a, a was a study quite a long time ago where um this researcher took two lakes in Canada mm -hmm. and actually polluted one deliberately with EDCs and left the other one clean and then compared the survival of fish in those lakes and showed very dramatically that the fish in the treated lake were pretty much wiped out. Wow. Yeah. So there's no question that, mm -hmm. that we do that and that that's going on. Um, and by the way, a lot of the chemicals that are manufactured have byproducts that go into the runoff for, <laughs> into the lakes, um, right? To right. the waste disposal. Yeah. But, yeah. So yeah. it's not a happy picture, but no, I, it's not. I'd, I'd like to just end by saying countdown, first Wait, of all, is very hold it up. Yeah. Hold it up next to your face. Hold it next to my face. There you face. go. And smile hey. for the camera. Yeah. Hi, countdown. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, we, um, first of all, the book has a lot of humor in it, has a lot of personal stories, and makes it... You have a great sense of humor. Yeah. And my author, co-author, Stacey Colino, is an environmental journalist who was really responsible for that tone, that you know ability to bring some light to it and some humor to it. Mm -hmm. And um, we have two chapters of things you can do. So don't feel totally discouraged. Get the book, read the book, and mm -hmm. then share it. Mm -hmm. I think sharing it is really important yeah. because that's how we spread the word. Absolutely. Yeah. Where, well, why don't you tell people where they can find more about you? Shaunaswan.com. That's me. It's um, all all over social media. You can look for me there. <laughs> I don't know, remember my Twitter handle. Or my, you know, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'll, I'll put yeah. it down yeah, there. Yeah, that'd be good. People can or I could send it to you. Perfect. Oh, I, yeah. already, I already got it. You have yeah. to send it. I got yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, cool. thank you again. I very thank much you. appreciated this. And, uh, that's all, folks.